Okay, this is What to the Slave is the Fourth of July by Frederick Douglass. A little bit of background information it gives you here, right? It says that this speech was given in 1852 um, to an audience in New York. And this is the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. So he's speaking to a group of women. Women were particularly active um, as part of the abolition movement during this time period. Fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? Of course, us here, right? He is speaking broadly of all people, basically, of his race, slaves and former slaves in the United States at the time. African Americans, slaves or former slaves. Remember that Douglas himself is an escaped slave, right? So he's speaking with the perspective of someone who has experienced slavery, but then also experienced what freedom looks like um, for, for Black people in the U.S. in the 1800s, which was um, certainly not equality at that point. And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude to the blessings resulting from your independence to us? So he's saying, like, do you want me to, like, be happy about this? Is that what you're expecting? That I should be happy about this independence? Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. You're saying, oh, I wish I could be happy, but I, I can't. Right? Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? So he's saying, if I could have freedom, I would certainly be grateful and I would be really nice about it, but that's not what I'm getting here. Who so stolid and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame man might leap as a heart. He's saying, I, I, I'm not. I'm not in that position, right? I can't be excited about that because that's not what we're experiencing. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between us, right? There's, there's separation between us. He was speaking to a group of white women as a black man here. I'm not included within the pale of glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us, right? This is a good key sort of central point he's making here, right? This very celebration of independence really highlights how awful slavery is. It only makes slavery seem worse. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. He says, I didn't get that. I don't get the freedom that you're celebrating. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. Central point he's making here. A star next to it. You may rejoice. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters, right, like in chains, into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems for inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. So he says, you are mocking me to make me come and speak here about, about the 4th of July, right? That's, this is, because I don't enjoy the freedom that you have. So making him... is mocking him. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions, right? He's talking about slaves here. 
whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them, right? So this is back to the same idea. So slavery was bad any day of the year, but it's even worse on the 4th of July because everyone is so excited about freedom. And then there's the irony that not everyone is anywhere near free. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. It would be shameful if you didn't stop and remember all the people that are still in slavery, right? He is free, he has escaped to freedom, but so many have not. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view, standing there identified with the the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. So he is being very critical here, right? He says, you know, this country never looked worse to me than it does here on the 4th of July, again, because of that contrast between celebrating freedom and so many people not having freedom. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. Those are strong words. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call into question and denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery. There's a lot going on here um, to really dig into his language in this little section here, right? First of all, he's, he's doing something that would have seemed kind of almost controversial at the time. If you don't it doesn't doesn't jump out that way at us now. But first of all, to stand to say that he's standing like linking together God and slaves, right? And people used religion to justify slavery, but he is saying that you know God stands with the slaves. So that that's a pretty dramatic thing for him to say at this point in history. Um, he's also is accusing them of going against the Constitution and the Bible, right? I mean, those are accusations of hypocrisy for the country. This is. It's a pretty strongly worded speech that he is giving. Well, let's see. Uh, the great sin and shame of America, right? That's what he calls slavery. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall confess to be right or just. So, basically saying it's not going to say anything that's not true right unless you are a slaveholder or you are prejudiced then you're going to have to agree with what he says but i fancy i hear someone of my audience say it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind would you argue more and denounce less would you persuade more and rebuke less your cause would be much more likely to succeed saying if they would try and convince people, he, he's sort of trying to imagine what, what someone who disagreed with him might say. And that they might say, you know, why don't you stop arguing so much and instead try and be more persuasive um, and not, you know, rebuke or scold, right? Don't do that. You should be more persuasive. Um, he obviously doesn't agree with that perspective. But I submit where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? That the point is conceded already, or that point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. So saying, look, look, you can't argue that they're not men. The laws themselves include that, right? So how are you going to argue in favor of slavery by saying that they're not men? So there's one problem right there. 
The slaves are human by the laws that the very slaveholders themselves have made. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which, if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? And so if you have laws, then you must acknowledge that that the thing you're making a law to regulate is human, right? We don't make laws that, um, you know, punish animals, we make laws that punish humans. So it says, you know, by your own logic, you're acknowledging that slaves are human. Manhood of slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read or write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue man argue the manhood of the slave. So there's no point in arguing this because this just is the laws themselves prove that that slaves are human. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that the slave is a man. Again, I mean, he's sort of making this is part of his rhetorical strategy, right? He's very repetitive and all the sort of different ways he's saying this, but really driving home the point of the absurdity of trying to argue that slavery is okay because slaves aren't human. Of course, slaves are human. And even um, using the, the argument of the Southern slaveholders, um, they're going to have laws that regulate slaves, then they themselves are acknowledging that slaves are human. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. It is not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. It says, it doesn't matter. We do all of these things like all other humans do, but we keep being called upon to prove that we are human and that, that this is absurd. Like, clearly, um, you know, people of color are humans. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You've already declared it. So now he's moving on to his next point, right? He's clearly proved there's no point in arguing the humanity of slaves. Slaves are obviously human by every other, you know, information that he's got. Now he's saying, okay, well, do you need me now to argue that we're entitled to liberty? That there's no point in arguing that because you have also declared that to be true, right? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Rep Republicans? It's a different use of Republicans now than it what was the different use of Republicans then than it would be now, um, just sort of take that word in context of this time period. Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principles of justice, hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom, speaking of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively? To do so would make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. So, so everyone... Everyone knows that this is wrong, right? And, and trying to argue that it's not wrong or that it is wrong is, is pointless because everyone should know that it is wrong. Especially on the 4th of July when we celebrate this document about liberty and freedom and so forth. What am I to argue that is wrong to make men brutes? 
But what am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to surrender their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission as to their masters? Must I argue that a system thus, thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. Time for this. Like, this is so clearly wrong that why would you even ask me to waste my time arguing that this is wrong? This is obviously wrong to anyone who looks at it, right? So, arguing that this is wrong would be a waste of his time. because it is so obvious. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine, that God did not establish it, that our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? They that can may, I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, <clears throat> not convincing argument is needed, right? So he's saying, you don't need me to convince you, right? So stop telling me I'm trying to have to convince you that slavery is wrong. You, we need to see the irony and the horribleness of it rather than be convinced that it's wrong. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery steam of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm and stern rebuke. For it is not light uh, that is needed, but fire, and not the gentle shower, but thunder. Right? So he's talking some pretty serious language here, right? Saying, look, the, you know, the time for talking about this peacefully, that, that this is not that time. This is time for strong language and, and for mockery, essentially, that the country should be mocked for the hypocrisy of having slaves. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed, and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Right? Pretty strong word. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer. A day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. This is it right here. He's going to answer his question. I'm going to put a little box around this, right? That's going to be his central point. I mean, he's been making that point throughout, but there he is really just stating it outright. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity are, to him, mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. This is harsh language. And you have to remember, too, that like in 1852, for a black man to stand up in front of a bunch of white people saying this is pretty revolutionary. I mean, granted, he's standing in front of a bunch of abolitionists, but still, there's even within the abolition movement, it's not like there wasn't racism within that. They just thought that slavery was wrong. So this is really very brave of him to use this kind of strong language. And it's one of the things that Douglas was really known for is eloquence in speaking out against slavery. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these, of these United States at this very hour. Okay, so we're gonna make a little note here, right? This is some very harsh criticism of the country. Last little bit. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. So this is an important ending, right? He's ending hopefully. He says, I don't despair. There is hope here. 
There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened, and the doom of slavery is certain, since it's going to end. I therefore leave off where I began, with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. So, this is brief in comparison to the rest of the speech, which is quite critical, but he says, you know, I have reason to hope. I think we're moving in the right direction that, um, you know, he has some faith in the in the government itself to, to move the right way eventually, right, the tendencies of the age, um, that, that freedom is coming. And this is, you know, about 10 years before the Civil War, freedom was coming. Um, obviously, it was a long and complicated fight that continues, but um, he had reason to hope. So there's an ending there, but not to discount the very strong language that he uses. There you go. That is Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is Important.